Welcome to the Money and Business Entrepreneur. Jim Rohn is one of the best self-development advocate of all times, who has inspired many and his words are still changing lives of many up to date. It's my humble request you spare some of your precious time and listen to his life-giving words. I promise you will thank me at the end of this video. Feel free to subscribe and join our community of entrepreneurs. Jot these questions down. Question number one, what makes life valuable? Interesting philosophical question. What makes life valuable, human life? Now that we find ourselves on this spinning planet, a chance to live a, a human life. What would make it valuable? Second question, what makes life worthwhile? Third question, what makes life work well? Good practical question. Now under work well, we could put, you know, spiritually, socially, personally, economically, physically, there's a lot of different aspects to making life work well. But that'll suffice because those questions I think are very vitally important. What makes life worthwhile? What makes it valuable? What makes it work well? And all the aspects. If your life doesn't work well in some aspects, what would you fix? And I've got some good answers on that. There's usually about a half a dozen things that makes 80% of the difference. That's the formula. There's usually about a half a dozen things that makes 80% of the difference. Now, what's interesting about this formula is it's not exactly half dozen and it's not exactly 80%. This is just sort of a unique way to say it. Here's another way we might say it. Keep looking, whatever the project is, keep looking for the few things that makes the most difference. Boil it down to the most important components that'll make, that'll take care of most of it. And I think if, if you look through a lot of major subjects, you'll come to the same conclusion. To be good in sales, there's about a half a dozen major things to practice that'll give you an 80% chance of really being good, being good in sales. For a management career, there's about a half a dozen things. For a good marriage, there's about a half a dozen things. For good health, there's not a thousand things you have to work on. There's not 500 things you have to do every day. About a half a dozen will take care of most of it. Now, what was exciting about this formula when Mr. Show first shared it with me was if there's only a half a dozen things, I could learn it. I mean, if there's 500 things, probably left me out. You know, I only went to one year of college halfway through my second year. So if it's going to take a lot of education, it's probably going to leave me out. But when he said, no, there's about a half a dozen things that'll take care of most of it, whatever the project is. I said, then if it's a half a dozen, I can learn it. So here's what I found out. Life change really is very simple. It's really very easy. Uh, for financial independence, there's about half a dozen things. No one, especially in this country, needs to go without financial independence because it's not that difficult to master. There's not a thousand things to learn. You, you don't have to go through all of the technology over a lifetime. Just a few things, major things that'll take care of most of it, and you've got it made. And in boiling things down for my teenage friends, that's what they're interested in knowing. Can I do it? Can someone like me master it? And the answer is always yes. I tell them I got rich by the time I was 31. I was a millionaire by the time I was 31. My teacher taught me well that six years from being broke at age 25 to being rich at age 31. And kids say, wow, how did you do that? Here's the best news I give them. It was easy. Best news they've heard for a long time. Here's somebody talking to you that got rich by age 31 and he says it was easy. easy. Now someone says, well, Mr. Rohn, if it was so easy to get rich by age 31, how come everybody else around you during that same period of time how come they didn't get rich? Here's why. It's easy not to. That's the best advice I can give you. In case you have to leave early, that's the heartbeat of my whole seminar. What's easy for one should be easy for all. Someone says, no, no, Mr. Rohn. For all the rest of the people around you during that time, for them it was hard, and for you it was easy. That's not true. You couldn't debate me on that point in front of this intelligent audience. What's easy for one is easy for everyone. 
However, let me put it now in a philosophical phrase since I tend to be a bit philosophical. Here it is. What's easy to do is also easy not to do. That's the difference between success and failure. That's the difference between pennies and fortune. That's the difference in flourishing and not having much. That's the difference between trinkets and treasures. What's easy to do is also easy not to do. I can give you in one sentence how I got rich by 31. Here it is. If you're ready, say I'm ready. ready. Here it is. I did not neglect. Now you've got to underline that. I did not neglect to do the easy things that I could do every day for six years. Now, once you've got that, you've got the heartbeat for life change. Underline did not neglect. <laughs> Major reason why people don't have it all. Neglect. How else would you describe it? Especially living in a country like this. And here's the problem with neglect for your notes. It starts as an infection. And if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. Indulge in neglect long enough and it'll have you by the throat. Shutting off air supply. Shutting off opportunity neglect is a disaster now here's the further compounding of the disaster one neglect usually leads to another neglect to do wise things with your money then you'll ne neglect probably to do wise things with your health neglect to do wise things with your health you'll probably neglect to do wise things with your friendships neglect to do wise things with your time neglect to do wise things with opportunity i'm telling you it starts to compound once the house starts coming down it starts coming down and it finally falls in disrepair. So the whole clue to life change, number one is to clean up all neglect. Because the rest of it is basic and simple. I mean, how difficult is it? So the key is to not learn another hundred things. People aren't healthy because they know a thousand things. No, people are healthy because number one, they find out the half dozen things. That's number one, find out. And number two, do not neglect the practice. That's the whole key. I can't give it to you in any simpler form. Find out the half dozen things. Now, sometimes it takes a while to find those major things. We pick up one or two and then we let it go. Finally, we master it. But the rest of it is simply do not neglect. If you'll just start cleaning up neglect. Mama taught an apple a day. Does what? I got a good tell uh, question for this intelligent audience. What if that's true? You say, well, if that's true, Mr. Owen, that would certainly be easy to do. Then what is the problem? <laughs> it's easy not to do. That's the problem. The problem is not lack of information. The problem is simply we don't do the information that's been handed to us. Simple stuff. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Anybody can do it. But what's easy to do is easy not to do. Or the guy messed up the saying. Guy says a Hershey bar a day. You say, no, no, you've been watching too much television. It's not Hershey bar, it's what? Apple. And if you lack the refined intelligence and you go for the Hershey bar instead of the apple, then you've got to put up with your own poor health. It's nobody's fault but your own. A few basics you won't practice, a few ideals you won't let them serve you, then you've got to put up with your own empty bank account, empty heart, empty soul, not enough vitality, not enough health. I'm telling you, anybody that wants to can rearrange all of that. And here's where life change starts. For your notes, I can't give it to you in any simple form. Here it is. It starts with an apple. Where else would you start if you wanted to improve your life? You don't need the exotic stuff, I'm telling you. Basic one, two, three stuff is what did it for me. And all you've got to do to start now the process of life change is start somewhere. And it doesn't even matter where. You can start with good health or you can start with something else. The key is to start by saying, I'm going to start the process in each category of finding by my own research. And that's why seminars are so valuable. That's why information is so valuable. That's why somebody willing to take the time to share is so valuable is to help boil it down in some form to the half a dozen few things that takes care of most of it. And then let me get on with practicing it and where you start doesn't matter. The process of life change can start with as simple a process as an apple 
a day, which means I'm on the road to cleaning up neglect. I'm going to walk around the block. I'm going to get the next book of my new library. I'm going to get a journal. Shof taught me to keep a journal. He said, don't just let ideas get by you. Don't trust your memory. If you're serious about really becoming an entrepreneur, if you're serious about affecting other people's lives, if you're serious about fortune, if you're serious about wealth and health, if you start collecting ideas, go over them and review them, then make them a part of your life and practice and don't ever look back. That formula helped change my life, brought me to where I am today. And I'm so delighted now to have the opportunity to go around the world telling the same story that I heard when I was 25 years old. There's a few basic things and if you practice them every day, I'm telling you, there's no reason why you can't have the health you want, the relationship you want, the fortune you want, the money you want, the income you want, the sophistication you want, the culture you want, the prestige you want, the influence you want, all of it is wrapped up, I think, in a nutshell of what I've just explained to you. A few things. Now, let me give you one more part of it. Here it is. Once you've found the few things that makes the most difference, now spend most of your time working on those few things. That now is another part of the clue. The first part of the clue is to get the information and consistently practice it. But here's the rest of the formula. Spend most of your time on it. The reason why a lot of people don't do that well is because they major in minor things. They spend too much time on things that don't count much. And they spend too little time on things that would count. So jot this formula down. If the equation is wrong, the results can be disastrous. If the equation is wrong, the results can be disastrous over a given period of time. Here's a guy in the last 10 years who's bought 2,000 donuts and two books. And this guy says, you know, my life isn't working well. Well, anybody in this audience could give him a seminar, right? Once we knew these numbers, here's what we might suggest to this guy. Hey, this may be one of your major problems. In the last 10 years, you've spent too much money on donuts and not enough money on books. You've spent too much money feeding the body and not enough money gathering food for the mind. And it's not the miracle of your body that works out your future. It's the miracle of your mind. But if you nourish the body and neglect to nourish the mind, I'm telling you, you're going to have all kinds of problems and all kinds of difficulties. So we would suggest, one of our suggestions in our seminar to this man would be in the next 10 years, spend a lot less money on donuts and a lot more money on books, food for thought, bread for the head, we call it. You got to have ideas that feed your mind, not just your body. And the miracle of the mind is so fabulous to work out your future, to give you all the equities you could possibly hope for, to give you every dream and every treasure you could possibly want for you and your family and the people you care most about. It's all available. But it is a very basic, simple process. Once you've found the few things, spend most of your time and money working on those few things. Okay. We call these basics. Basics. Fundamentals. Another good word. If you're going to play football, you got to learn the fundamentals. And there's about how many? There's about a half a dozen, right? It'll make you good at it if you practice those half a dozen. A few other things, yes. But the half a dozen are what's important to lay the groundwork. <laughs> Basics. Fundamentals. Now, let's talk about the fundamentals of life. Let me give you this little series to jot down. Number one, fundamentals of life. Number one, there's just a few. There's just a few fundamentals of life. About a half a dozen. Fundamentals of life, there's just a few. Here's number two. Once you know them, you know them. I mean, there's nothing difficult here. It's pretty easy to figure out why people are broke. And it's pretty easy to figure out how people get rich. It's no big deal. Fundamentals of life. Number one, there's just a few. Number two, once you know them, you know them. Now here's number three. There's no new ones. Written history is what? About 6,000 years. There's nothing new here. Now there might be a new way to say it. There might be a new way to apply it to the 20th century, getting ready for century 21. 
But this stuff is basic, it's old, it's fundamental. So be aware of somebody who comes along and says, we got new truth. Say, no, you can't have new truth. Truth is old. So be a little suspicious. If a guy says, we're manufacturing antiques, you got to come watch our plant. Wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be a little suspicious? You say, no, you can't manufacture antiques. Antiques are what? Old. So antiques are like truth. Truth is old. Now, just because you've discovered it is no sign it's new. Say, no, truth is old. The, the fundamentals go way back. The fundamentals of sowing and reaping go way back. The fundamentals, good, evil, go way back. I mean, there's nothing new here. All we need to do, though, is to just bring our intellectual discovery process to bear and see if we can't find those few things. Then the rest of it is to get busy practicing those few things. We might all agree on number one. Philosophy, this is where the value of human life begins to show versus all other life forms. I call it simply a guidance system. Settling on certain questions and making decisions about what direction in life you're going to take. Setting goals, making plans, this guidance system. I've boiled it down to each one's personal philosophy, a guidance system. And we all need a guidance system for two reasons. For your notes, number one, to avoid the dangers. Somebody's got to give us some clues first on how to avoid the dangers. And number two, to take advantage of the opportunities. To see and understand the opportunities, take advantage, and to avoid the dangers. It's about as simple as I can put it. A guidance system necessary to do that while we journey on the planet spinning through space. Philosophy. To develop this guidance system, we use our mind to think and to process ideas and information. It's about as simple as I can put it. That process helps us to develop this guidance system. Now, interestingly enough, only humans have this unique ability of all life forms on earth. Dogs don't have it. Alligators don't have it. Spiders don't have it. Only humans have the ability to use their mind to think and process ideas and information and adjust this guidance system, however necessary, to make your dreams come true, to avoid more dangers, maximize more opportunities, and enrich your life. Only humans can do this. All of the life form is driven by the genetic code and instinct. A goose can only fly which direction in the winter? South. How come a goose has to go south in the winter? Because he's a goose. He can't go any other direction. But not true human beings. Human beings can go North, they can go south, they can go east, they can go west. Human beings can live one way for five years and then tear up that script and live another way for the next five years. Only humans can do that. It's unbelievable. Humans can double their income, triple their income, live one way for a while, totally scrap that idea, live another way for the next few years of their life. It's unbelievable. Humans can do this. Now, let me give you my best opinion. Each person's philosophy is the major factor in how your life works out. Each person's philosophy is the major factor in how your life works out. Now, up until I was 25, that would never have occurred to me. That my personal philosophy was the major factor. If you would have known me when I was 25 years old and you would have said, Jim Rohn, how come you find yourself here? This is pitiful. Living in America, you're broke. You got pennies in your pocket. You got nothing in the bank. Creditors are calling. You're behind on your big mouth promises to your family. You've been to at least one year of college. How come you find yourself in this pitiful position? If you would have asked me that question when I was 25, it never would have occurred to me to blame my philosophy. That would not have occurred to me. I would not have said to you, well, I got this lousy philosophy. What else would you expect? I mean, that, that would not have occurred to me. What would have occurred to me to justify where I was at age 25, I would have said, well, it's the government. It's much easier to blame the government than to blame myself. It's those Democrats. They told us they would fix it. So that was a lot easier to blame. I used to blame the company. This is all they pay. Make the American dream come true with this paycheck. I used to blame the economy. I blamed interest rates. 
I used to blame taxes. Taxes are too high. Top federal tax rate when I first started paying taxes, 91%. I used to say that's too high, but now the top federal tax rate's about 33%, but people are still saying it's too high. How could that be? If it's gone from 91 down to 33, how could it be too high? I'm telling you, it isn't too high. But back then, that was a convenient excuse for me. I used to blame my negative relatives. They were always putting me down. My cynical neighbors won't loan me money. They were on my list. I used to blame the weather. I blamed the traffic. I blamed circumstances. This happens to me and this happens to me. And then on top of that, this happens to me. And they expect you to do well by your family. All of these things I thought were the reasons why I was not doing well. Then I found out all of that was not true. Here's what I discovered that changed my life forever. Everything that happens outside of us is like the wind that blows. We've heard about the winds of economics, the winds of change, the winds of circumstance, the winds that are favorable and the winds that are unfavorable. The wind is always blowing. In America, we've probably got the best wind that's blown in 6,000 years. And we all need a wind of all of this stuff happening to take us somewhere to the dreams we've got, to the money we want, to the equities we want, to the treasures we want, what we want for our family, friends, and all the rest. Here's what we want. We've got the best win in 6,000 years to take us there. But here's the clue. If you just let the wind blow, you won't be happy with your arrival. You won't be happy with where it blows you. You won't be happy with where it takes you. You say, well, what can you do about the blowing of the wind? Well, you can't do anything about the blowing of the wind except set a better sail. So draw you a little sail on your notes and take that home as a centerpiece of what I've shared with you this whole day. You cannot change the blowing of the wind, but you can change the set of the sail. That's why education is so important to help you with ideas that helps to alter a little bit the set of the sail. That's what the sermon is for on Sunday morning. That's what the lyrics of the song that prompt you to think are for. That's what the dialogue of the movie is for. That's what conversation is for. That's what education is for. That's what satellite is for. That's what a stream of ideas are for, to help you adjust and keep adjusting all of your life the set of the sail. Then I found out if you went to work on this in a concentrated way, you could so alter the course of your life that the outcome in a fairly short period of time would be absolutely almost overwhelming. For your money, for your health, for your relationship with your family, for equities of all kinds, business, whatever. Wouldn't matter. And you could finally set such a sail that after a while, you could care less anymore about the wind that blows. Why? It's not going to matter to you because you've learned how to set the sail. And interestingly enough, the same wind that blows others to disaster, blows others on the rocks, blows others on the beach, blows others to places they don't want to be. The same wind takes us to prosperity, takes us to all the dreams we've got and the things we want. Why? Because we've learned to intervene and set sail. That's the key. And that's why I lecture. That's why I speak. That's why I talk. That's why I talk to my children. That's why I talk to my grandchildren. That's why I talk to every ear I can get attention from. And that is, listen to ideas, whether they come from me or from someone else. Be a collector of good ideas. Get more serious about altering the course of your life. And you can, regardless of what happens in the next five years, getting ready for the turn of the century, you can wind up where you want to be. The money, the joy, the pleasure, the satisfaction. Set of sale. Now, what is philosophy if it's so important? I teach kids how to be rich by 40, 35 if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. Kids say, hey, that sounds good to me. How do I do it? And I say, it starts with your philosophy. So kids ask me, what is philosophy? It's kind of a big word. So I've broken it down for them, made it easier for me to understand. Here's my definition of philosophy. Philosophy comes from number one, the collection of all that you know. Gathering knowledge is the first key to developing the philosophical set of sail. And then number two, deciding which of this information is valuable enough to bet your money and your time. That's about as simple as I can put it. To change the set of sail, regardless of the wind that blows, first you search for knowledge, then you got to sort through it. 
and decide which of it is valuable enough to spend money and time. That is one of the best equations I know of. You might know a thousand things, but you can't do a thousand things. You've got to sort through a lot of information and boil it down to the things that really matter to you and utilize that as the most important pieces, deciding what's valuable. So first of all, we got to gather knowledge. When I have a chance to talk to my high school friends, first thing I tell them is you got to have the information. Get it while you're here. Don't leave school without it. One of my little phrases for my high school friend. What they teach here, what you think of it, that's up to you. What you're going to do with it, that'll soon be up to you. But right now, this is the important thing is to get it. You can sort through it. You can cast aside whatever's not going to work for you in the future. But the important thing is to be serious enough to get it. Okay? I teach them there's nothing worse than being stupid. Right? Being broke is bad, but being stupid is what's bad. And what's really bad is being broke and stupid. <laughs> nothing much worse than that unless you're sick. Right? Sick, broke, and stupid. <laughs> That's about it. So number one, you've got to know. You've got to have the information. Now, where do we get ideas and information? We've got this marvelous ability here like no other life form on earth has to alter the course of our life. You don't have to keep flying south. If south is not getting you the money and the joy and the pleasure, I'm telling you, you can alter the course. You're not like just a blind animal that has to be driven by instinct in the genetic code. So if we want to change our life, we've just got to use this marvelous mechanism to gather more ideas and information and see if it'll pay off for us. So where do we get this? Jot this down. Number one, from PE, I call it personal experience. Just make it a point from now on to learn more from your own personal experience. That's probably the best university in the world. Your own personal experience. You've been through enough that could teach you. Personal experience. Log the questions from your personal experience. Log the answers from your personal experience. Right? Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of health. And here's where it can all start. Paying more attention to your own personal experience. One way to learn to do it right is what? Do it wrong. That's one way to learn. Now the key is, don't let it take too long. If you've done it wrong for 10 years, we suggest that's long enough. We don't suggest 10 more years just to prove a point. <laughs> no. You can prove any point in 10 years. In 10 years, your health disciplines will be on track or what? Off track. Your financial independence will be on track or off track. It doesn't take that long to come to the conclusion based on your own personal experience, whether you're on track or off track. In a few years, you've either got the breath or you haven't got the breath. You got the money or you haven't got the money. You've got the self-esteem or you haven't got the self-esteem. I mean, it doesn't take much from your personal experience. Shof was swift to point out my personal experience. I said, let's learn from that. He said, Mr. Owen, you've been working six years. I said, yes, sir. He said, how are you doing? I said, not very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. <laughs> what a swift analysis of my current situation. He said, couldn't we find out what happened the last six years so that you can alter the course the next six years? That had never occurred to me. He said, I'm telling you, we can learn so much from the last six that we can make the next six years totally different than the last six. And that's exactly what he did for me. That second six years, my life so swiftly changed. It was absolutely incredible. At age 25, I was broke. At age 31, I was rich. And he said, Mr. Owen, if you'll make these changes starting today, he said, the next six years of your life will be totally different than the last six. I took him up on that. So now let me give you that promise. In case you have to leave early, here's the promise that changed my life for your notes. He said, if you will change, everything will change for you. If you will change, everything will change for you. Before I heard that promise, up until age 25, I used to go through the day with my fingers crossed, hoping things would change. Hoping my boss would change, hoping the company would change, hoping the weather would change. Certainly hoping circumstances would change, hoping the wind would change, 
hoping the economy would change, something would change that would give me a better chance to have a better life. Then I found out that's not what needs to change. It's going to be like it's going to be. Politics are going to be like they're going to be. Unlevel playing field. It's going to be like it's going to be. Right? The races, the mix. It's all going to be like it's going to be. The difference is going to be you. But he said, if you will change, everything will change. But then he also gave me the warning. Here it is. If you don't change, nothing will change. <coughs> And he said, the next six years of your life will be just like number two, OPE, I call it other people's experiences. That's why I was invited to come by to give you my point of view. Other people, their experiences sometimes can be so valuable. How valuable is someone else's experience? I'm telling you, it could save you a divorce. Someone else's experience could save you bankruptcy. Someone else's experience could save you a heart attack. Someone else's experience could help you not to waste five years someone else's experience to give you a clue something they've lived through give you some clues you don't have to go through it or at least if you went through it and then you'd learn how to survive other people's experiences can be so valuable and that's why the process of learning is so important to invite people into your life to invite people to come by or to go where they are now there's two kinds of people to learn from jot this down number one failures you got to learn from failure it's too bad failures don't give seminars. They would be valuable. Problem is we don't want to pay them. <laughs> Here's a clue. Learn from negative as well as positive. We've got to be a student of negative. We've got to be a student of failure. We must be students of evil as well as good. If a guy's messed up his life for 40 years, just say, John, would you spend the day with me? Be a valuable day. Say, I'll bring my journal and take notes. Good looking guy like you, beautiful family, every reason to do well, threw it all away. Tell me how you messed it up. <laughs> Let him talk to you for a day. I'm telling you, those notes would be just as valuable as the notes you're taking today. Because the guidance system serves two purposes. Number one is what? Avoid the dangers and number two take advantage of the opportunities we need both sets of stories we need both experiences to draw from so the clue is to learn from negative as well as positive that's why the bible is such a classic book a list of stories on both sides of the ledger those that got it together and those that threw it away those that paid attention and those that let it slide those that bought up their opportunities and those that sold it out i'm telling you what a collection of stories on two sides. One called examples, the other one called warnings. Good sets of stories, warnings and examples. And if your story ever gets in one of those books, make sure they use it as an example, not a warning. <laughs> so learn from negative as well as positive. In leadership we teach, find out what poor people read and don't read it. Find out how they talk and what? Don't talk like that. Find out they're blameless and what? Tear it up and throw it away. It's not serving them well. So learn from negative as well as positive. But now here's the other side. Learn from positive. People that have got it together. People that have got good health. Find out. A mother who has magic with her children. Wouldn't you want to know? You say, Mary, meet me tomorrow morning for breakfast. Neat little cafe. You won't believe the service. I'll pick up the tab. So you meet Mary for breakfast and you say, Mary, I got to know, where'd you get this magic with your children? Mary says, well, to be honest with you, up until three years ago, my kids were out of control. And then I read this book and I went to this class and they taught me a little one, two, three, four. And I've been practicing that now for the last three years. That's how come I got this magic with my children. Would that be a valuable breakfast? Would you pick up the tab? Of course, information is always available at such a small cost. How much is a book that could save your life, right? How much is a conversation that would just take a little time, take a little effort, okay? From the positive side. Now, there's three ways to learn on the positive side. Jot this down. Number one is to observe. We learn from what we see. We put some of it on video so you can see it. 
Send it by satellite so you can see it. We ask you to come, not just to listen, but we ask you to come and see what's happening. Come and see people in action. Come and see people who've got the job done. Come and see. So be a good observer. Here's one of the best universities available, the University of Life. So keep your eyes open all day and learn. Some people have got it together. Some people are letting it slide. Learn from that every day by what you see. Be a careful observer. Here's a good watchword between now and the 21st century. Pay attention. Watch what's happening. Don't be casual now about gathering information that can be useful to your life. Casualness leads to casualties, whether it's on the highway, the freeway, or whether it's in life. You can't be casual with your health. You won't be happy with the results. You can't be casual with a marriage. You won't be happy with the outcome. You can't be casual with a friendship. You won't like the disastrous consequences five years from now, 10 years from now. Come on. The next way to learn from others, of course, is to listen. We sometimes put it on cassette so you can listen. Somebody whisper in your ear over and over again. Turn your car into a mobile classroom. Do your share of listening. Listen better to the sermon on Sunday morning. Listen to the lyrics of the song. Sometimes the songwriters of, are the current poets of the day. One rock and roll song says, we're working on the mysteries without any clues. How well said of a generation. Listen to the lyrics. Listen to the dialogue in the movie. Don't just be caught up by the story. Do your share of listening. Part of the opportunity to learn is to listen well. Now, here's my last part on listening. Be a selective listener. Don't saturate your mind, consciousness, with a lot of stuff that doesn't count much. Be a selective listener. It's like tuning in the radio. You got to tune out the static, tune out the silly, tune out the shallow, right? Tune out the mundane, the stuff that isn't gonna count much for your health and your life and your future, for your family and your fortune. Just shut out a lot of that stuff and tune in to voices of value. That's the key, searching for voices of value. Be a selective listener. We must teach our children to be selective listeners, not to waste most of their time on the things that don't count. That's how life gets eaten up and leaves you with just the shell and not the substance. Now, number three was important. Shove taught me read all the books. He got me started on my library when I was 25. I've now got one of the better libraries. If you saw my library today, you would be impressed. You would probably say, no wonder. Mr. Rohn was invited to come, talk to us one more time, look this. Library. No wonder he's invited to speak around the world. Look at this. Library. No wonder he's healthy. Look at this. Library. No wonder he's got something to say. Look at this library. I'm asking you to have the same reputation. No one of this family's healthy. Look at this. Library. No one of this father's got it together. Lacks not the vocabulary nor the stories to articulate for his family the vision of the future. Look at this. Library. No one of this mother's super confident striding into the future with her children, arms around her children, confidently taking them into the 21st century. No wonder she's confident. Look at this library. No wonder this person's got a sterling sales career. Look at this library. No wonder this person understands management second to none. Look at this library. No wonder this person's an extraordinary entrepreneur building an incredible organization worldwide. Look at this library. I want you to have the same reputation. Got to build a library. I haven't read everything in my library, but I feel smarter just walking in it. <laughs> my library. I was smart enough to buy it all. Now I got to be smart enough to read it all. Then I got to be smart enough to sort through it all and decide which of it is valuable enough to bet my money and my time. I want you to have that same procedure. Gather knowledge. Don't be lazy in learning. It's too important to your future. Don't be lazy in gathering information. That's why I appreciate you coming here. Appreciate you spending this much time. Appreciate you taking notes one more time. Some of you have already taken enough notes to last for a lifetime. You've been through seminars for many years of your life, but you're here one more time. And if someone else was speaking, I would be in the audience. Guess what I would be doing? Taking notes one more time. I'm telling you, never cease your quest for knowledge. Never cease your quest for learning. Because the next idea may multiply the value of your life by two, by three, by five, by 10. 
A lot of the fortunes of the world were built after the people became 50 and 60. Why? Suddenly, from a vast now amount of experience, comes that next idea. And no matter how much you know, you never know when the last little piece is going to multiply it by so many times. It's unbelievable. We in the Millionaires Club invite a billionaire once in a while. Come talk to us. And he says, well, you guys are doing okay, but come on, get your act together. Put your life into all kinds of equities and values. Read the books. Now, Shof recommended three. Let me give you those. He recommended more, but these were the three that got me started. One was the Bible. My parents made sure I was a pretty good scholar by the time I was 18, 19. The Bible, what a collection of stories, what a collection of vision, what a collection of poetry and history, what a collection of nuances, ways to say it unmatched by any other collection of documents that I know of. The Bible. Number two was a book called Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich. Shelf said to me, Mr. Rohn, doesn't that title intrigue you? I said, yes, sir. He said, wouldn't you have to get that book? I said, yes, sir. So I went searching for it. Guess where I found it? In a used bookstore. I paid less than 50 cents for it. I've still got the copy. Found out later it was a rare hardback cover. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill. What an extraordinary little book. Helped change my life. Now, another book to help me become a millionaire by 31. Here's the title. If you're ready, say I'm ready. ready. The title is called The Richest Man. The Richest Man in Babylon. I use this book as a textbook teaching kids wealth by 40, 35 if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson, C-L-A-S-O-N. This book massively affected my life. Jot this down now under the title, Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson. Number one, this little book is easy to find. Easy to find. The average bookstore's got it. If they haven't got it, they can get it for you. It's easy to find. Here's number two. It's easy to buy. The most you can pay for it is $12, $15. You can borrow that from your kids. $12, $15. Kids have got the money these days, right? Whoa. Number three. You've already guessed number three. It's easy to read. It's in story form. That's why I use it for kids. It's in story form. You can read it. I'm telling you, in two or three concentrated evenings, you could read this little book. If you got inspired, you could read it in one evening. Lord, I would hope some out of this audience would get inspired. Read this little book in one evening. You'll never be the same. You may come back to thank me years to come. Now, here's number four. It's easy not to look for this little book. And that's the heartbeat of my whole presentation so far. It's easy not to look for this little book. And now I've given you the answer to almost everything. Haven't you ever wanted a simple little formula that gave you the answer to almost everything? I've just given it to you. This is it. This is the formula. The answer to almost everything. Number one, easy to find. Number two, easy to buy. Number three, easy to read. Number four, easy not to look. That's the answer to almost everything. Someone says, how come my paycheck isn't any bigger? This is, I've given you the answer. This is it right here. I used to think it was the economy. I used to say, this is all they pay. Mr. Shelf said, no, Mr. Rohn, that's all you're worth. I thought, whoa, new way to look at it. I said, you know, things cost too much. He said, no, let's face the real truth, Mr. Rohn. You can't afford it. I thought, new look. He said, hey, it's not it. It's your problem. It's you. And this is it. This is the answer to almost everything. It's easy not to look. I've recommended this little book now to about three and a half million people over the last 33 years.
by satellite and by every other means. Guess how many have actually gone and found this little book? Answer, very few. My best guess is about 10%. Go find it based on my recommendation. You say, well, Mr. Owen, why wouldn't the other 90% go find this little book? Answer, we don't know. What do you know? You don't know, I don't know, nobody knows. Here's my most profound philosophical statement for the day, if you're ready. Some do and some, that's how profound this stuff is. You don't need to be a technical engineer. You don't need to graduate from Harvard. This is it, some do and some don't. In the case of this little book, about 10% do and 90% don't. That's the answer. Guess when I went and found this little book? The same day. <laughs> the same day I heard about it, I went and got a copy. Someone says, well, does that make you different than most everybody else? And the answer is yes. Yes. Somebody says, why is that? We don't know. <laughs> you don't know, I don't know, nobody knows. Guess how many people in America have a library card? 3%. Wisdom of the world available. Change your health, change your life, change your future, change your marriage, change your relationship with your family. There's no lack of information. But 3% of the people have a library card. 97% couldn't be bothered with the wisdom of the world. At 4.15, the guy's not headed for the library. He's headed for happy hour. Two for one, and it doesn't mean books. <laughs> and this guy wonders why he doesn't get paid more. I'm telling you, the answer lies here. Now, here's my advice. Join the 10%. Walk away from the 90%. Don't talk like they talk. Don't use excuses like they use. Join the 10% who find a little book. Join the 3% who have a library card. Guess how many people can retire from the income of their own resources when it comes time to retire? 5%. 95% wind up dependent. 5% wind up independent. I'm asking you to join the 5%. Walk away from the 95% who won't marshal their resources to a good end. I'm asking you to walk away from the careless walk away from those who blame an unlevel playing field or blame the Republicans, right? Or blame their employer or blame the economy or blame interest rates and taxes and prices. I'm asking you to walk away from that kind of thinking. Join the 5%, join the 3%, join the 10%, and you'll have the kind of life you've always wanted. For those who do, those who do become the envy of all who watch. And the 90% wonder why it doesn't happen for them. And they wonder why you were so lucky. But your testimony will now be, here's how I did it. I went and found the book. I got me a library card. I put my finances together so that I became financially independent. I joined the 5%. I'm asking you to do that. You must take on responsibility for your own education. Now, those first few years of our life, right, we were forced to. Through high school, you got to go to school. Someone says, well, I've finished school. Well, it's okay to finish school, but here's the clue. Zig Ziglar said it well. Don't finish your education. Education is a lifetime matter. Education goes on and on. The next clue can double the resources of the values of your life. Never cease your quest for knowledge. Become self-educated. That's the clue. It's like motivation. You've got to be mostly self-motivated. Life reserves all of its treasures for the self-motivated. Somebody says, boy, if somebody just come by and turn me on, what if they don't show up? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you've got to have a better plan for your life. Self-motivation. Now, here's the last clue. Self-education. Formal education gets you a job. Self-education gets you rich. Formal education make you a living. Self-education make you a fortune. So I'm asking you to do like you're doing today. Never cease your quest for knowledge. Develop a thirst for ideas that can be life-changing and then pass it along to your children. What's been so exciting for me ever since I learned this stuff, I also learned ways to pass it along. At first, I passed it along to my employees. I passed it along to the people who worked for me and some of the people that I knew in my neighborhood. 
But then, when I was invited to step outside my little comfortable environment of my corporate world and step out to the public like I'm doing today and share it with an audience outside, that's when my life took on a whole new dimension. And there isn't anybody here who can't share. Recommend a book.